Have you ever wondered how money actually flows in the AI ecosystem? Sam Altman recently said that soon, a single person will build a billion dollar company alone. No employees. And it's important for you to know that over the coming months and years, you will either be one of two persons. You'll either be the person funding AI with subscription money, or the person capturing value from how it's monetized. Which one you end up on is really just a personal choice. But if you understand how AI companies are actually making money today, you can position yourself differently in case you do want to earn money on this in the future. In this video, I will break down the business models that turn AI into money-making machines. From foundational models to apps, chips, and consulting. And I want to be respectful of your time. If you're here for the big picture overview, which I would highly recommend, then just stick with me. But if you're only here to understand where you are most likely to earn money in the AI space, I'll highlight the two most important categories up front so you can jump straight there. I'm Ali Salem. I currently work as a director in a tech company. And on this channel, I help you turn tech and finance into your personal advantage. We'll start off with the foundational models. The brains everyone borrows when they don't want to build their own. This will be your OpenAI, Anthropic, and Google Gemini. And basically the idea here is that they build out the LLMs, the brains, and they rent it out. There are basically three ways that they make money. The first is probably the one you're most familiar with, and this will be your subscription models. 20 bucks per month for your ChatGPT Plus or Claude Pro, etc. Millions of people basically having a Netflix account for talking robots. The second way is a usage-based API. You're basically getting charged for every token that you generate. For you that are unfamiliar with tokens, it basically means that you are getting charged by the syllable. So don't get poetic unless your budget is poetic too. And the third way are the enterprise and licensing deals. These could be private deployments, compliance add-ons, or strategic partnerships with cloud hyperscalers. And you would think that these companies make most money off of you and me with our subscription models. But reality is, it's the last two categories where they make the big bucks. And it's likely to keep growing as more agentic AI capability gets rolled out into the enterprise space, where the LLM will of course act as the brain behind the agent, meaning that the consumption will be booming. Shifting into the next layer, which will be the AI application and SaaS, these are basically your companies that take these brains and give them an actual job. Now, if you listen to Gartner or McKinsey or any other analyst reports, they will basically segment this space into two categories. It will be your vertical apps and it will be your horizontal apps. But if you listen to VCs or people that are building the apps in the trenches, they actually typically call out a third category as well, which are the consumer apps. And the reason for that is that the consumer apps have a vastly different dynamic in terms of how they work. But let's start off with the horizontal apps. These are basically going to be your general purpose tools. Examples here would be the ones that you are very familiar with. It's your ChatGPT, it's your Claude, it's your Gemini. It could also be other productivity tools like Notion AI or Grammarly. And the play here is scale. You wanna go wide, and grab as many users as you can along the way. Shifting into the vertical apps, these will be your industry-specific or niche-specific tools. Now, in a previous episode, when we discussed jobs at risk from AI automation, we specifically discussed two startups that were on the rise called Paradigm and Ender. These two operate specifically in the spreadsheet space and are prime examples of vertical apps. Other examples would be Harvey for lawyers, Hippocratic for healthcare, or basically any AI-powered CRM add-ons for sales teams. Now, these apps build deeper modes by combining domain expertise with the customer's proprietary data. Shifting into the third category, consumer apps, again, analysts would probably lump this into your horizontal category, but we are not gonna do that because they behave very differently. For context though, Think about AI-driven apps that you would typically just download on your phone. These could be diet apps, fitness planners, personal finance bots, or language tutors. Now, the reason why it works so differently in this space basically just comes down to churn. And if you're unfamiliar with the term, it's basically just a fancy business way of saying losing customers. Because reality is, in the context of consumer apps, People like you and me, we are flaky, 
savage beasts. So these apps typically only survive if they go viral, hook us with freemium and keep throwing new shiny features at us. And really, that's the reason why it's separated into its own category. B2B relies heavily on sales teams, procurement cycles and partnerships, whereas consumer AI relies heavily on virality and app store dynamics. And VCs, for that reason, tend to treat consumer apps in its own category because of its unique risk return profile. Now let's look at the revenue models. And it basically comes down to four categories here. Starting off with the one that you're probably most familiar with is going to be the subscription model. This is your typical SaaS style approach where you pay a monthly fee. The second way is that you charge per seat. A good example of this would be GitHub Copilot where they charge around 10 bucks per developer. You could think of it as Spotify for coding, but without the Drake ads. The third model is the freemium model. And the play here is that you basically allow the users to use your app for free, and then you either nudge them to move over into a paid system after a certain amount of time, or you let them play free perpetually, and you offer specific features within your app that are paid. And this could be either subscription or one time. And the fourth model is your enterprise licensing. These will be your six or seven figure deals for enterprise customers that wants a customized deal. Quick pause, I have a favor to ask. If you're enjoying this so far, you should definitely consider joining the small but very exclusive group of around 5% of viewers that have actually subscribed. Which is funny because this is coincidentally the fifth episode that I'm releasing. So let's see, maybe we'll be at 6% by the next episode. And if you're already subscribed, I just wanna say thank you. You are basically an early investor in the channel. Shifting to the third player in the space, and this will be your cloud and infrastructure providers. Every model needs compute. Enter AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, and friends. And these players basically have three ways that they approach their revenue models with. The first is pay as you go compute. You pay as you consume. The second is pre-built APIs. And the way this works is that they basically tie it to a function. It could be translation, vision, speech to text, and they charge you by the call. And the third revenue model are the enterprise contracts. These are basically reserved GPU fleets. Think of it as writing a $50 million check to AWS to guarantee cloud compute, so you don't get stuck waiting behind someone that is fine tuning their Llama chatbot at 3 a.m. in the morning. And the fourth player in the space are the hardware and chip providers. These are basically players like Nvidia, AMD, Intel, and Chinese players like Huawei and Graphcore. They also have three revenue models. The first one being pure hardware sales. This will be your high-end GPUs like the H100 or Blackwell. The second model are their systems and appliances. Examples of this would be Nvidia's DGX servers which are basically plug and play supercomputers. And the last revenue model is cloud access. Nvidia also rents its hardware via the DGX cloud. And interestingly, this is a revenue stream that puts it in direct competition with AWS and Google Cloud. All right, the next players in the space are going to be your consultants and professional services. Not everyone can just plug and play agentic AI, APIs, and all the other tools that you need to make this work. And that's where consultants come in. Your typical players here would be firms like McKinsey, Accenture, your big four, and various boutique firms. And they sell everything from strategy to custom builds, integration, and training. We'll hold your hand while you fire half your staff and replace them with chatbots. Just joking. And there are typically three types of revenue models here. The first is a project-based fixed fee approach where you just charge the customers a fixed amount to execute the project. The second approach is more of a value-based pricing approach where the firms take a percentage 
off of what they're trying to achieve. So this could be a percentage of the cost savings that they realize or a percentage of the revenue boost that they create. It's basically sharing the risk of the project with the customer. And the last option are various forms of retainers where the customers can call off advisory when they need it. Examples here would be general support or optimization of a deployment that the firms have been doing. And the last one is uh, fairly unknown for a lot of people, but those would be your data providers. Now, the reason why this is important is as famously said by someone very smart, garbage in equals garbage out. And garbage costs companies trillions every year. Players in this space would be Appen, Defined AI, Bright Data, and mostly AI. And the revenue models that they provide are data as a service, which is your subscription fee for clean data sheets. And the second approach is custom labeling. This would typically be bespoke annotation projects which are priced per job. And the last model, which I think is pretty cool, is synthetic data. The way this works is that they offer AI-generated data sets. And in practice, it often builds on a proof of concept approach where a customer starts off on a freemium model, they try a smaller data set, see how it works, and if they're happy with it, they would move on to an enterprise license where these companies would generate synthetic data at scale. Now, we've covered six players in total, and let's tie it all together. So basically, you have NVIDIA and the hardware providers that are selling GPUs. Cloud providers like AWS and Google Cloud would procure the hardware and provide them in cloud and infrastructure services. Foundational models like OpenAI and Anthropic would use these servers to train their foundational models. And from there, these foundational models are gonna be used in applications, which are gonna provide all sorts of functions and benefits. You will have your consultants integrating them into your enterprise workflows. And then you have your data vendors that keeps the whole thing fed. So it's less like a pyramid. It's more kind of like a lasagna. Every layer charges you a rent. And that was it. And if you like this video, I think that you are gonna love this one. It basically shows you how to become AI native in less than nine minutes. And as always, thank you very much for sticking with me. And I'll see you in the next one.